Okay. So why is it that that acyl halide is most reactive? Good question. Well, remember, the reason why these um, go through similar reactions in the first place is because they all have possible leaving groups. But which of these has the best leaving groups? Yeah. Halogens are great leaving groups. Halogens are great leaving groups. That's why that goes at the top. Well, both of these have an oxygen leaving group. These both have oxygen leaving groups. So why is this a better leaving group than this one? And the ester. Why would the anhydride be a better leaving group if in both cases we'd be putting a negative charge on the oxygen when it leaves? Because the anhydride's resonance stabilized. Okay, that's good. That's very good. Uh, unfortunately, at this point in the course, students still usually don't think about resonance, but it's crucial to be looking for resonance whenever we can. This negative charge is resonance stabilized because the negative charge, charge can either be on this oxygen or this oxygen over here. So it's good that you thought of resonance uh, here. That's one of the most important habits to start getting into, always looking for the resonance forms. All right. Um, and that explains why this was a better leaving group in the first place. It's easier for it to leave and take the electrons because it knows the electrons will be stabilized. So that explains why anhydrides are more reactive than esters, even though they both have oxygen leaving groups. OK? Wait, that was formed from an anhydride? That resonance structure? This is what we would get uh, if uh, this leaving group leaves, right? So if a nucleophile came in, well, it would really be two steps, but. So this is the L group over here, right? Mm -hmm. This is the L group on this anhydride. Okay. Um, the L group on the other one is an O minus. That's all. And o over minus. here would be an O minus. O R That's right. minus, yeah. Yeah, O R minus. Thanks. Sorry. Well, this is not as happy because it's not resonance stabilized. Thank you. One thing that's really crucial for all these problems is to correctly mentally identify the leaving group, to correctly identify the L group. It should usually be pretty simple, um, although it, it's harder when you're in the middle of a reaction. Uh, you have to identify the L group up front. This is maybe the trickiest case to find the L group over here, but this is the uh, carbonyl that we could say got attacked, so this will be the leaving group over here. Okay, um, so uh, that explains why anhydrides are more reactive than esters. Also, I was saying that uh, for many purposes, carboxylic acids are similar to esters in reactivity. Well, why would we expect them to be kind of similar? They both have an oxygen leaving group. It doesn't make much difference whether you have a hydrogen or an R. Um, in both cases, you have a negative charge on the oxygen when you left. That's a little misleading. They're not, there are some differences in reactivity between them. That's why I don't like to put it in the same table. But for some purposes, carboxylic acids are similar to esters in reactivity. All right, and then why would amides be at the bottom here? Well, nitrogens are less electronegative than oxygens. So the nitrogen is less happy to pick up a negative charge than the oxygen is. We're trying to explain oh, why this would be. Right. Generally speaking, things that are less electronegative are not as good leaving groups because what makes something a good leaving group? A good leaving group is somebody who's willing to lead and take the electrons with them. A leaving group has to take the electrons. Well, who wants to take electrons? People that are electronegative. So generally, this oxygen we would expect would be a better leaving group than the nitrogen. So this is the leaving group we would get from an ester, and this is the leaving group we would get from an amide. Well, which of these is happier? This looks happier because uh, it, the oxygen is more happy to have a negative charge since it's more electronegative. Um, and therefore, it was more willing to leave in the first place. Uh, so why are electronegative atoms better leaving groups? Because they're better able to stabilize the negative charge that they're going to have when they leave. A leaving group, if you start neutral and you leave, you end up with a negative charge. Uh, well, nature doesn't like those charges, but if you're electronegative, you're better, you're better able to stabilize that charge than if you're less electronegative. Okay, so even if we forgot this table of reactivity, we should be able to figure it out again, but it's also good just to memorize these orders here. Okay, so uh, that's our uh, direction of uh, reactivity. We uh, still have to actually look at the reactions. Oh, one thing I should say is, in the past, we generally said, uh, in the past, we generally said that neutral oxygens and neutral nitrogens could not be leaving groups. 
Uh, we, we generally didn't have a neutral oxygen as a leaving group uh, in the past, uh, even though it is electronegative. We usually were not just forming O minus as a leaving group. Uh, but this is an exception to that. And the reason we're able to do that in some cases here is that, again, that allows us to reform the carbonyl. The carbonyl is an especially stable bond, so we can kick off leaving groups that wouldn't normally be allowable leaving groups if, we're, uh, if that allows us to reform the carbonyl. And when we start going through the mechanisms in, in one minute, we'll see why allowing these to leave lets us reform the carbonyl. So sometimes that'll be uh, allowable uh, and what, we'll be able to use leaving groups that we might not have used in the past. You've actually already seen a bunch of reactions um, where we actually are using O minus as a leading group, which we haven't done in the past, and this is going to be another example. Okay, so, um, so we should actually start looking at uh, the reactions that happen here. second we're going to look at that, but we still have to keep comparing it to the previous reactions. So here's what an aldehyde or a ketone would do. We want to see how that's not what a carboxylic acid would do. So an aldehyde or a ketone would do something like this, or like this, or I'm not going through the whole mechanism. But anyway, these are the reactions we've seen for aldehydes and ketones. They get attacked by nucleophiles. Sometimes the nucleophile attacks only once, and then the carbonyl oxygen still sticks around. I'm going to keep asterisking the carbonyl oxygen. And sometimes you have two separate nucleophiles attack, like when you have alcohols attack a carbonyl, and then the carbonyl oxygen has completely left as water. Or sometimes the same nucleophile attacks twice, and that's like what we would get with a, 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 an amine, or we would get an imine. So these are the reactions you had for the last midterm. These are the reactions for aldehydes and for uh, ketones. The last time we called this category one, this was category two, and this was category three over here. So there's a bunch of different things you can have for aldehydes and ketones. Fortunately, uh, and this is just the bare bones because we saw that the confusing thing is that each of these steps could be preceded or followed by protonations or deprotonations. That could be the most confusing part of all these reactions, knowing when to protonate or deprotonate. These are the basic reactions for aldehydes and ketones, but these could all be preceded or followed by protonations or deprotonations. So now we want to compare that to what happens when we are attacking a, a uh, carboxylic acid or an acid derivative. Well, here the basic reaction is... So the first step looks the same as before. The first step is the nucleophile attacks the carboxylic acid and acid derivative. So remember, we'll use this L as a good symbol for any carboxylic acid or acid derivative functional group over here. So this will apply to all of these different things that we were just looking at and the carboxylic acids. So so that would give us this, this tetrahedral intermediate. I would give us this tetrahedral intermediate over here. All right, and what's going to happen now? Well, remember that that molecule is unhappy that it's lost its carbonyl. The molecule is unhappy that it's lost this double bond. It would like to reform that, if possible. Well, then we can kick these electrons down. Now, that's only going to work if we can free up some room on this carbon over here. But all along, we're assuming that this is something that could possibly be a leaving group. So now the L group is going to leave. So this is the basic pattern of all the different reactions that you've been seeing for the last week or so. And again, this is the reason why the instructor went through these so quickly, because in his mind, they're all the same thing. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there are some details and snafus, but they're, they're all the base, same basic pattern here. OK, wh why couldn't the aldehyde or ketone do this? Why couldn't it reform the carbonyl? Because it doesn't have any decent leaving groups. There's no decent leaving groups here. R and H are not leaving groups. Um, that's the big difference between these reactions and these over here. So before then, we did usually protonation steps to form hemiacetals, or another nucleophile attack to form acetal. Is that correct? Uh, I didn't follow that. I'm just reviewing right. everything on the top right. So before, because it couldn't just kick off to create that double bond, it would either protonate to form a hemiacetal, or it would just have another nucleophile attack. 
That's right. Like that might be preceded by a protonation too, but that's right. Okay. So this would be an example of the pattern where we form a hemiacetal. So in some ways this is simpler because the lead yes. leaves. Okay. That's right. So if you were forming a hemiacetal, that would be this pattern here, where right. you have a single nucleophile right. attack. Okay. And this would be the pattern for a full acetal. Okay, so yeah, in some ways this is sim simpler. However, again, I've left out the most confusing part, which is that, so, so how many steps are there here? Well, there's basically uh, two steps. Attack the carbonyl, reform the carbonyl. The, 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 the second language book has a good way of putting it. It says there's basically two steps. Attack the carbonyl and reform the carbonyl. Um, who attacks the carbonyl? The nucleophile. And then how does the carbonyl reform? It reforms by kicking off the leaving group. So part of reforming the uh, carbonyl is kicking off the leaving group. 